welcome to the Ephemera Society. We're here with David Lilburn. Tell me about this national conference each year the Society has. Fine, Brian, first of all, thanks for coming over and doing this. It's, it's wonderful. Um, Ephemera Society many years ago got together and formed the National Association with lots of areas coming together, postcards, trade cards, photographs, etc. And when you get a national club, mm -hmm. it's very hard to keep people together, especially in those days without the internet. So once a year, we would meet up somewhere. And in more recent years, and I think for about the last 20 years, we've been meeting at the Hyatt Hotel mm -hmm. in Greenwich, Connecticut. Yeah. The last um, occupied uh, event in Greenwich was 2019? Correct. Before the pandemic? Correct. 2020 was, uh, the theme was women... Um... Exceeding expectations. Ah, very... We'd already done women's emancipation, mm -hmm. which of course last year was the anniversary of, and we wanted to honor women. Mm -hmm. And so we, 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 we ran with that title, which of course left it wide open. We had yeah. some fabulous Yes. And the one that stuck out in my mind was C.J. Walker, uh -huh. first black woman millionaire, ah, whose granddaughter presented. Mm, that's interesting. And it was a great story. I think I might have seen the movie. Did she do hair products? That's the one. Oh, yes. I think For she the was black yes. communities. And Very it nice. was. But the, you could see from the passion with which granddaughter gave it. Mm -hmm. uh, coming through it was just tremendous. That's wonderful. You know, often uh, in our social media society, uh, especially with Me Too movement, um, equal rights for women, um, it's very interesting that you know, ephemera, really meaning temporary, ephemeral, um, things in the past that people typically would throw away. Now we're privileged or not privileged to see that everything is recorded. So ephemera is really history talking back to us, um, which is, I find it very interesting, um, me starting out in books. Tell me more, what were some material or some leftover things that typically a person might throw away, whether it's a, a newspaper clip, what sort of things survived that really shows some of the history you've seen over the years? What survived? Well, it's amazing what survives, and, and you'll never know the reason for it. Mm -hmm. It was so insignificant at the time that it just got put in a pile to throw out but didn't get thrown out. Mm -hmm. uh, people kept it because they thought it was important to the family, you know, the, the, yes. uh, the purchase of the first car. This was the receipt to the first car, first driver's license. Mm -hmm. People stuck those in files. Mm -hmm. um, I hear horror stories about these files being tossed out oh, yes. without being gone through. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, lots of stuff got saved. Yeah. And, and as, to, as to what, I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you'll, you'll never know. I, I'm cataloging right now mm -hmm. um, uh, El Tak, the Egyptian, mm -hmm. writing from Boston. A, a general um, uh, mass-produced letter type script letter with a little photograph in it and he's offering to read the stars why go obviously to a woman mm -hmm. or women mm -hmm. and enclosed is a little photograph he's offering to read the stars so you don't fall into the trap of marrying the wrong person uh -huh. and the photograph that's enclosed is a representative likeness of the person that will be your partner wow and only send 25 cents in an envelope wow to me mm -hmm. and give me your dates of birth etc and i will follow up wow i mean who keeps that sort of thing that is interesting i don't know who's going to buy it either but <laughs> it's fun maybe tinder or one of these uh... there you go for their museum yeah, yes for the museum yes oh it's pretty fascinating one, uh, when I was going through YouTube, a very fascinating um, thing that I ran into um, was basketball. And uh, seeing how 
uh, the YMCA, how, you know, religion and how training the body was seen as something um, worthy. Mm -hmm. And that's really started the integration. There was uh, African American leagues and white leagues, and they all played together, which is not really well known. Um, and this was only possible because certain people kept those uh, postcards with dates and uh, and I found that very interesting mm -hmm. and I, don't, I think there's a lot of basketball fans that really don't know about that history. Well, I think you'll find the Jewish uh, uh, migrants to America were some of the very first to work out basketball too mm -hmm. because the immigrant communities and the black community mm -hmm. were left in very confined spaces nowhere to go and exercise and and work out and, and, and yes. get that energy out and so this was designed mm -hmm. and I'm sorry I don't know the history but yeah. uh, it was designed to give exercise to people in confined spaces very interesting and so anybody in confined space I'm sure they'd be playing basketball yeah yeah one um, one thing that I found um, and tell me as uh, vice president and uh, almost president of the Brown Society, what, what sort of things do you believe can introduce more younger people to the society? Uh, I started off doing marketing for an antique firm and there was this phrase that the newer generation tends to say that they would prefer to buy experiences than things. So we see a lot of more digital um, movements Obviously, there is that environmental aspect, but I think there's the beauty lost, especially in well-made books, um, well-made things. Um, I see that flea markets, of course, you know, from um, you know Salvation Army to Goodwill, a lot of people are now thrifting. You know, Macamore mm -hmm. should have made it cool again to thrift shop. Yes. Um, what What would you say uh, to them or? What is your mission statement for the for a family society? What do you hope to achieve? I think reaching the young is really important. This is why I love sitting down with you, Bob, because I think you know you can reach that sort of person. Yeah. What we're looking for is um, a way to present a family, mm -hmm. so people know what it is, find out what their passion is within a family. And collect that. So, if nobody sees what ephemera is, nobody's going to collect it. Yes. But if you see a trade card and you say, "Oh, gee, my dad was a printer," you know, what was printing like back in the 1940s? He used to set the type. He came back from the war, set the type. Mm -hmm. Now, this would be your grandfather, my father, where he was. Yes. And then, once you get into that, you say, "Oh, they they set type." Well, they were still setting time. What happens today and what happens before that? How did they do it back in the 1800s? And then how did Gutenberg do it back in the 1400s? Very true. So um, I think once you find an area, then you can start collecting. Yes. And when you start collecting, then you learn. And you also, by building a collection, you build an investment because um, individual items, hard to sell. Yes. A collection. I've got printing from a sheet from the Gutenberg Bible all the way through to uh, last century's classic, you know, Moby Dick, mm -hmm. uh, Rockwell Kent's production. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've got print. It, it would make a really interesting collection. I mean, that's just yeah. one area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, my first introduction to collecting ephemera, I didn't consciously realize it. I love movies, and I used to go to Regal Cinema in Poughkeepsie mm -hmm. uh, every week, and um, the movie tickets I would, you know, just collect, and I would just throw them out. I had mm -hmm. a ton of them, mm -hmm. and what one movie ticket in particular that I saved was The Dark Knight 2008, which is... Mm -hmm. one of my prized possessions um, and my brother encouraged me to put like a, a collection together and I have a binder mm -hmm. and when I show people 
it's sort of like back in the 90s, I still remember this, you go to somebody's house and you see their DVD wall and you sort of scroll, uh, okay, oh, you watched this, I watched that. And it's almost like a conversation piece. Um, same thing with libraries. Obviously you are a bookstore owner um, and really in the past and even in the present today, libraries are more for decoration and things of that nature. But there still is a hunger for knowledge and for books and also to relate to somebody. Um, what is um, the bridge, would you say, being a book dealer um, and seeing the benefits of having a library, of having something within the house that connects you to something deeper? Let me go to the collection first. Yes. I think that's a great way to start. Uh, a ticket for a movie theater gives you the date, gives you price, mm -hmm. the location, which is historically rather interesting. Mm -hmm. So what did Brian Ulu watch when he, his formulative years? Mm -hmm. And they can go through the tickets and they can say, well, of course, he saw this movie here and it's his, his thoughts on that subject. Um, now, as far as when you go into someone's house reading, see, as I grew up, See, my generation were books, yours mm -hmm. were movies. So I could go into a house and somebody would invite me in, mm -hmm. and I'd see the bookshelves. And once you've seen, you know, half a dozen shelves of books, you've got a pretty fair idea of who you're dealing with. Because you see the titles, you know where they relate. And even if you haven't read them, mm -hmm. you know, as a book dealer, I can tell. Oh, yeah. So it, it's interesting. Uh, for 2021, um, what is the theme this year? It's going to be next year, okay. 2022. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be March. March, okay. And it is in short spaces and places. It's it's the design of gardens, houses, mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of uh, uh, um, uh, agricultural uh, and, and living spaces okay. and the designs thereof. And of course, the lectures are all to be illustrated with a family. Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't want just blueprints. Yes. You want to see the history of it and, and how you get to this design. Oh, very interesting. I um, I took a course in um, architecture, and um, interesting enough. Uh, Universities tend to be the biggest collectors of ephemera. Mm -hmm. um, just as uh, every university, most universities have a special collections. Mm -hmm. And when I went there, um, they have books that, of course, these are primary resources. Um, being that we're in the pandemic, I find it very interesting that you know we were told to be inside and to be in spaces. Um, and I'm really excited to see what kind of spaces people back then lived in and how they sort of cope because it'll be interesting to see what sort of mindset people are in in the Spanish flu happened in the, in the early sure. 20th century um, and really sort of you know maybe nothing never changed maybe we just recycle history and we just don't know about it oh I think uh, things change mm -hmm. technology changes yes for instance today you know as a print seller as well, so it's books, maps, and prints. Oh, yes. Um, I found, especially when you're dealing with Australia, mm -hmm. that the windows, have, the technology in the windows has become so good, mm -hmm. you don't need insulation. So usually the windows in the old days were small because they wanted to keep the heat in or the heat out, yes. one or the other. And now they can the, the, the windows will regulate that. So you can have bigger windows to more open leaving less wall space for prints. Oh, but that is true. So technology comes into this as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, yeah. you know, one design mm -hmm. throughout history. One design with, with with rocks, one design with concrete, one design with brick, one yes. design with, you know, steel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What sort of things, not only in your youth, but today, do you see um, people cherish or people tend to want or to collect everybody has their own niche but even with maps i find that people have a nostalgia to 
see what their place looked like back then. Um, what sort of things have you seen? A lot of people in the genealogy today. Mm -hmm. So my wife just come back from Vermont, mm -hmm. uh, where she was staying in the great, great, great grandfather's house that he built in Wardsboro, Vermont, in 1786, 87. Oh, wow. And uh, she's she was going up there looking at grave sites and looking for family genealogy. Mm -hmm. And she found the house, and it just happened to be the guy who owns it was there. And he said, and we, we're now friends, and every year we go up and stay in that house. Oh, that is interesting. So genealogy then uh, becomes, OK, so what did the town look like? Yes. So. Um, Kathy started collecting Wardsboro and area uh -huh. maps, postcards, frank envelopes, letters, etc., etc., to see what life was like in Wardsboro back when her family were there. Mm. It's almost like reconstructing a movie in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and there is definitely an interest in genealogy, Ancestry.com, um, and one of the things you always see is that tree, and you see uh, the Garrier types, ten types, and these things that uh, you have uh, an abundance in your store. Um, and I think it is important for people to not throw these things out because it's it's a connection to the past. I have a lot of trouble sometimes because I get these albums, and it's nobody important. It's ten types. But it's from Poughkeepsie, say. Mm. And the album is a nice leather album, or, yes. or it's split, or whatever. And I don't know what to do, because I can't tell a story about the people within it. Mm -hmm. There's no story about the binding or the, the, the method of display. Yes. But I can't get rid of it. Some, that's just someone's family out there. Yes, yes. And so I have a pile of these at the back, and I just see them, mm -hmm. keep them, because I don't know what to do. Yeah. And I know they can't be thrown out. Yeah, it is very important, even for groups that did not have, per se, have access to these sort of um, technology. Uh, we have to take a look at minority groups, uh, mm -hmm. lower economic groups. And uh, now, in terms of, there's been conversations of uh, reparations and, mm -hmm. um, and all these things, and for there to be some sort of, maybe, justice, atonement, or things of that nature, um, there has to be a record. Um, and also another aspect of it is how people are taught. And uh, for example, I'm not sure if you heard of uh, Rosewood or Tulsa, mm -hmm. um, where history sort of gets erased and people, people are now just trying to rediscover. Uh, I, I think it's that they've tried to sweep it up. But there's records of it. There are letters. There's postcards. There's there's uh, documents uh, in government things. I mean, if you went to the mortuary, you're going to have to find some. Nice, yes. So I, you know, it's knowing where to look. But yeah, I think there are many instances like those mm -hmm. which have tried to be covered up, which will come out. You know, as people yes. get in and, 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 and ephemera floats to the top, which suggests, and someone with a, a, an, a, an interest yes. delves a little deeper into it, and then it comes forward. And, yes. and uh, once it becomes in the focus, yes. then things start to happen. And, and, and the sooner we embrace these and, and, and uh, realize what's happened, the better, in my mind. Because you, you, you can't sweep it under the carpet. It, it's it's not it's it's, it's history. Um, I, I feel very strongly that we should uh, understand it, put it out there, and uh, like like the, the the Southern Confederate statues. Do we destroy them? No, they're history. But if they were made in 1870, and they're standing. That was for a Civil War hero. If they're made in 1930, mm -hmm. you know it's to to yes. uh, for political reasons. Yes, now, yes. 
don't knock it down, put a big sign up saying, this was produced in 1930, you know, yes. uh, uh, who did it and, and why we think they were done. Yes. To educate people. Yeah, yeah. There's sort of, um, there's this inclination, uh, speaking of the Civil War, you had the women of the Confederates or uh, mm -hmm. that group, that around the early you know, 20th century, they, it became like a lost cause narrative. And you know, going through history, you can sort of almost investigate, you know, what what happened. So we, uh, ephemera has very broad wings because mm -hmm. it covers every aspect of life. Mm -hmm. um, if we just even just think about today, um, we think about um, what we do every day. You know, we go out the door. Um, we might still get a, a newspaper. Or not even that, even uh, what type of noodles we like, ramen noodles, you know. Or, or where we buy our coffee. Yeah, oh yes, where we buy <laughs> Starbucks. Uh, we have a lot of receipts, you know, exactly. and, uh, and people, you know, people don't really consciously think of it. It's almost like uh, if you're an accountant or, or if you just for one day decided to say, you know what, let me look at my receipts and you have the day, the time. And often, one of the unfortunate and fortunate things of humans is our memory. We have very fading memories. Uh, I mean, what did you do uh, three Wednesdays ago? Unless something significant happens, we forget. And uh, I think it's sort of interesting um, that we can sort of catalog certain aspects of our lives that sometimes we don't pause. Um, something, you know, that we think it's, you know, temporary or ephemeral, you know, that we should really meditate and, and think on it. Absolutely. Yeah. Although we're enter entering into a whole new world these days. Yeah. With the uh, drones mm -hmm. and the potential proliferation of drones, mm -hmm. as in indicated with Amazon saying they're going to deliver by drone, mm -hmm. um, drones don't just deliver they're filming the entire way. Mm. We have, Amazon has their ring doorbells. They're continually filming. Yes. There will be a record of absolutely everything pretty soon. Yeah. And with supercomputers, mm. and uh, they want to find out, someone wants to find out what you did on the 24th. Mm -hmm. I've got you. Do dawn till dusk, <laughs> yeah. and and inside as well, because Alexa is listening to you as well. Yeah, you know it's also interesting, um, not just of today having uh, technology to view the present moment. Um, has the society done anything to sort of um, preserve this history in terms of scanning, um, archiving things, or having like a database? The society itself, that's not its mission. Where to get people interested in ephemera and encourage people to be interested in ephemera, to get them together for cross-pollination so that we, you know, we're, we're talking and seeing what all, all these areas are. Uh, but in the UK, the ephemera society there, uh, again, not quite in the ephemera society, but the head of the ephemera society, is doing a, a database of everything she collects mm -hmm. and buys before she'll sell it mm -hmm. is scanned and uh, recorded everything and yes monstrous quantities of the family go through oh wow <laughs> so when i get the ephemera booklet um one thing that surprised me was the universities are also members of course hmm. What, uh, but you said earlier on how yeah. they're the big customers for this because they try to tell history mm -hmm. and uh, that's the best way to get people in mm -hmm. to history. Yes. Is to, is to see something from the period, touch it, feel it, everything else, mm -hmm. and work your way back. You pick out a book from the same time period, you're reading it through the bias. Oh, yes. Whatever that bias of that author is, is in it. One thing people always want to do is, is to invest, you know. 
And um, what really what really intrigued me, starting out with books, is that I never knew a book could cost more than a thousand bucks. <laughs> you know, um, obviously there's many factors that uh, go into pricing a book per se. And what's interesting, and we've spoken about this, uh, you as a great mentor, that uh, ephemera has sort of overtaken, in some sense, the antique book market. The desirability, yes. Mm. Simple reason. The books have been there for so long, and they've been the primary mover for an area. You want to collect books, my collection's on tea. And if you wanted to collect, what you collect is books on tea. Well, most of the big collections are complete with their books on tea. They've got everything from the earliest references uh, uh, in the 1600s, actually earlier, uh, through. But now, what they want is to make it more visual, to make it more open and up to people to be able to look yes. at. Mm -hmm. So ephemera fills that gap. So my, you know, I consciously started 30 years ago mm -hmm. collecting tea ephemera. Mm -hmm. I, I, yes, I buy books, mostly pamphlets, okay. and I do a couple of books, but only if they're super unusual, super scarce, mm -hmm. because I know eventually when my DXS, my collection, mm -hmm or my family de-accesses it because I can't do it myself because <laughs> I love it too much. Yes. Um, people aren't going to want all the books and all the ephemera. Mm -hmm. They'll want the ephemera because they've got most of the books. Yes, yes. So. Yeah, that's very interesting um, because you want, even within you know the 2022 20, theme, places and spaces, when you know we go back to the steam you enter somebody's house i i never thought of it in a sense when you have a library you want to accent it you know and typically what i found being a book collector is people would just take off a page here or there um and you can attest to this back in the 19th century um people had book binders that's why you have these intricate you know books that were bound and some people, you know, didn't buy any books. Sometimes they would just come unbound. And you see them, you see the, you know, the proliferation of prints at James being used as art because they're almost so beautiful that you don't want to keep them in the page. That, that happened a lot. Mm -hmm. They're called breakers. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of dealers that did that. Mostly back in the um, 70s and that was sort of the, the, the heyday. They were doing it before that, but that seemed to be the heyday. Mm -hmm. They were breaking it all up for print. As I told you before, technology on the windows has meant less wall space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people have been less into purchasing okay. numerous prints uh, because there's a window in that space where they mm -hmm. want to put the print. <laughs> yes. But uh, back to the point of uh, publishers issuing books, mm -hmm. um, Many in the 18th century would come out as paper wrappers, mm -hmm. so boards, paper boards with paper spine, and then you would give it to your binder and yeah. they would bind it up. The French carried that tradition on for many years mm -hmm. and issued just with paper wrappers, and then you'd take it to your binder yes. and your binder would bind it up into the style that you wanted for your library. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So you spoke about your tea collection. So um, personal, you are not only, you know, when sometimes when I think of you, I think of, uh, you know, you have the book dealer, you have the awesome person, but uh, sometimes when you get to, you know, a certain age, you know, of course you're still young, uh, <laughs> people stop collecting because you just have so much things. But um, uh, please tell me more about the TFM you collect and what made you, you know, get into that. It's a weird way, just like everybody's story is different. Mm -hmm. Mine happened to be that I met a, a, a guy that I played rugby with from Kenya, I might add. Oh. And uh, he was a tea taster. Mm -hmm. And Kenya, 
playing rugby, he was a rugby player, mm -hmm. and he invited me to his birthday party. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, sure, happy to. So in between the invitation and the party mm -hmm. was an ephemeral society mm -hmm. fair and conference at Greenwich, Connecticut, which I attended. And knowing he was a tea taster, I said, I'll buy him some tea. Ephemera. Yes. So I bought a few things. I looked around and I said, well, have you got tea? And I bought some really lovely pieces. And I wrapped them up. I went to the party. He opened the door. I said, many happy returns. Mm -hmm. He said, wow, this is fabulous. And as he's doing that, I'm going, I want it back. <laughs> I've been lusting after them ever since. And he still won't give them back to me. <laughs> he thinks... <laughs> He thinks I'm very rude to even ask. But, but anyway, so I realized mm -hmm. that I, I've always loved tea. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that's what I wanted to collect. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you see tea in my shop for sale, that just means I've got a yes. copy already. And, uh, and the type of tea being from Kenya, we drink a lot of uh, raw British tea, a lot of milk tea. You have a red tea. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, well, you can always drink it without. Yes, no, but the, 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 there's green, black, and red, ah. and uh, Kenya and the, the African, the, mm -hmm. the uh, east coast of Africa is noted for its red teas. Oh, very interesting. Um, do you, in terms of teas, do you collect Oriental teas? Um, the tea product, no, I'm I'm purely paper. Yes. So I want the wrappers for those teas. Uh, you know, so if, if it was bound in a, in, a, in a tin, I want the wrapper that went round the tin. Mm -hmm. I, I tend not to go for three-dimensional. Yes. However, I have got a couple that I thought were mm -hmm. uh, meaningful to me. So yes. I have those in my personal collection, not in the uh, yes. tin collection. Do you collect Eastern European, you know, brands as well as? Sure. I, I do tea generically all over the world. Okay. And all, through all the time periods. Mm -hmm. So from the, uh, uh, you know, obviously I have got no access to early Chinese tea mm -hmm. uh, and, and paraphernalia related there too. Mm -hmm. And I really have to start with the uh, uh, Robert Fortune books yeah. uh, from the 1840s and 1850s. Mm -hmm. He was the British botanist that went to China, can I use the word pilfer, steal, um, industrial espionage, let's put it that way, <laughs> yes. to get tea, because tea was growing in India, tea mm -hmm. was growing elsewhere, mm -hmm. but they were inferior plants, they, they weren't the fine variety that China had, yes. and so he went, uh, disguised as a mandarin, mm -hmm. with, a, with his I, I don't know what a manservant uh, butler mm -hmm. is termed, but a uh, guide mm -hmm. would take him around and he, he would uh, keep pretty quiet because his Mandarin knowledge was limited. Mm -hmm. And he went to the tea districts and was able to get samples of plants. Yes. And he made records, he, he learned, uh, and then the idea was to get these to India. Now, the first attempt at it failed because uh, they didn't have the technology to get the, the tea saplings back mm -hmm. uh, in fit enough condition to grow. But the second attempt, there was what was called a, a Wardian case, mm -hmm. which was a glass top box which the plants were, were, were planted inside mm -hmm. and sent by sea to India, and it was a little ecosystem. They didn't have to water it, they didn't have to do anything, and it got there. And that group managed to get to the uh, Darjeeling, uh, you know, yes. out to Darjeeling, to the growing areas. Yes. Uh, and that's where the teas today come from. Oh. Well, not really. Yeah. The Indian tea comes from. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that, you know, tea has been a part of American culture. Uh, Mm -hmm. Just thinking of the Boston Tea Party, mm -hmm. um, what um, you know in your travels, what sort of 
correlations or events that you found interesting about tea? The tea history is enormous mm. and, and great impact on the society. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, let's take slavery. Mm -hmm. um, tea came to Britain, mm -hmm. but it was decided that it was to be drunk with milk. Mm -hmm. And people liked sugar. So when people started drinking tea, they would add sugar. Mm -hmm. So they'd have to have more sugar production, which is the West Indies, which meant more slaves. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of uh, uh, um, negative aspects mm -hmm. to the tea coming into England. And of course, mm -hmm. tea originally had to be purchased from China. Yes. And it was so much money that Britain wasn't able to pay one way all that amount. Yes. And China, being uh, self-sufficient in all products that they wanted, mm -hmm. the British couldn't export to them to try and balance the trade. Uh -huh. So they introduced opium. They did from India, they got from the poppies, from Afghanistan, that region, mm -hmm. they got opium. And they put opium into the market in China, creating lots of havoc. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Chinese authorities were not happy. Mm -hmm. And we have the first opium wars. Oh, yes. And then the second opium wars, yes. which, of course, Britain being the superior at the time, uh, uh, and naval power and, and military power, because there were warlords in China rather than a unified unit. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we get Hong Kong coming out of this, the five sink ports, the, the, the areas where the foreign ships were coming in, Hong Kong became British. There's an agreement from the Opium Wars, which was about tea. Wow. It's, uh, it is international. And, uh, and today, um, you are spilling all the tea, which is a meme, um, sort of like Lipton with a hermit of the frog. <laughs> um, so tea still is very much in the world consciousness. Another main interest of yours is the environment and um, natural uh, prints and maps, uh, pertaining to birds, botanical, both flowers and, uh, and birds. Yes. Yes. Well, historically, they have always been uh, big areas of collection. Mm. Um, interestingly, flowers, people look for the color or the plant, and everybody loves flowers. Mm -hmm. Birds are different. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. People love specific birds. Mm. But other ones, oh! <laughs> so we have in Australia a magpie. Mm -hmm. That's a black and white bird, very protective of its area, mm -hmm. and will swoop if you go into its area if they've got young there to protect the young. Oh. And so a lot of people are very, they, you know, if they see a yeah. magpie on the wall, they, <laughs> they don't like it much. Yes. But, they, they, you know, they, uh, there are certain birds, uh, a budgery guard, for instance, mm -hmm. or, or a, a Gouldian finch oh, yes. that yeah. everybody loves. Those, but most of they either love or they hate in the birds. Oh, fantastic. And uh, one of the uh, a bigger collector item is, uh, is the Audubon, you know, uh, sure. prints. And uh, well, what's been your experience with, with that sort of collection or well, other ones as well? Look, when you get the best, mm -hmm. it, it, it's always good. Audubon was never in my consciousness until I moved here mm -hmm. uh, because we had John Gould. He was the father of Australian ornithology okay. and, and uh, he was at the period of the 1840s, mm -hmm. actually 1830s through the 1860s mm -hmm. and um, he actually went to Australia, took his wife uh -huh. and they went looking for the, the, the birds. Mm -hmm. Well, Audubon was that little bit earlier so you don't see that the early Audubon material, yes. like I can see the early 
improved material because of the, uh, the years earlier that that was done. And, but when I saw those first, the big folios of oh, birds, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're incredible. Yeah, they're huge. They're yeah. stunning. Yeah. But of course, then there's the price. Okay, <laughs> printing technology was uh, limited. Mm -hmm. There was only certain techniques, a lot of hand color, making it a very expensive print from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, we can't really afford the first, mm -hmm. so let's go to the quarto size ones, which were published, which were hand colored. Okay. And they're the ones that you can afford and you can have a, 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 at least a representation of the bird mm -hmm. in smaller format. Well, thank you, David, for having me, and uh, I'll be seeing you probably tomorrow and uh, for days to come, and uh, we'll have okay. a lot of more content. It's, it's been a delight, Brian. I, I didn't quite know where you were going to go with this, but, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it, it's, it's fabulous. Yes. You do a good job. Oh, thank you. And uh, keep up the good work. I look forward to talking to you again soon. All right. Take care.